Hello, welcome into WLOI, Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOI.org and Campus TV channel 111.1. You're listening to After the Whistle. Sorry for the little delay here, but welcome to After the Whistle. I'm your host, Jeffrey Bozzi, alongside my co-host, Jimmy Cody. Jimmy, how's everything going today? Everything is going well. Um, unfortunately, we're having some technical difficulties at the start there, so it was a little annoying, but um, it's beautiful outside, so I'm enjoying that. The weather has been fantastic recently yeah i'm not really sure why but it's still 70 something every single day down here and it's november you would think it got a little cooler but no it's still pretty hot and it's really warm and i'm not complaining one bit i can wear a t-shirt and shorts every single day if i have to but it is going to get a little cooler so i guess enjoy it while it lasts is i guess what i'll say about the weather but um as far as as the sports go we have a lot to get into and we're going to start off the show discussing the World Series, which concluded this past weekend on Saturday night as the Houston Astros won the World Series. They defeated the Philadelphia Phillies in game six by winning four to one. And Houston being down to one, they found a way to claw back into the series thanks to some good pitching and some timely hitting from a lot of their players in their lineup. And most notably, I would say in game six, Jordan Alvarez had a monster three-run home run that went 450 feet, which gave the Astros a 3-1 lead after being down one nothing, And then they had another run there from Christian Vasquez with an RBI single. And then they held on from there and they won their second title in now that's five years, I believe. Second title in five years or six years? Six years, sorry. Second title in six seasons for the Astros. They finally are able to beat an NL East team in the World Series after they lost to the Braves and the Nationals in previous years. So yeah, I guess, Jimmy, what do you think the key was for Houston? Because obviously they were down to one. There were some games where they got behind early and like game three and they weren't really able to score. But in other games, games one and two, they got out the leads. They didn't hold one. But what was the one thing you think that stood out for Houston that was the key to them winning the World Series? Their starting pitching started showing up. And that's honestly what kind of changed the series, I felt like, because Framber Valdez, um, he pitched very well. Six innings, nine Ks one run you can't ask for much more than that i mean especially in a game six of the world series he's not the number one guy you're not asking for much more than that he turned over the bullpen with a four one lead right so that's you can't ask for much better than that also in a situation for the for the offense um to be up four one and for you guys i mean i, I said this um before the last game in, in philadelphia you couldn't go back to houston with them having a lead because that just was a disaster you guys need to give yourselves, I think, like a chance to like take one of two, right? And that would have been a much better situation. Um, it sucks for you guys because I, I really did feel like you guys were in a good position or position, especially early on in the series. And I thought like you took games that I really didn't expect you guys to take. I thought taking game one was huge. Um, but unfortunately, it, the fact of the matter is your offense was not able to get it done in the situations that they needed to. And that's kind of why you guys didn't win the series. You didn't take advantage of the situations that you had, especially when it came to the runners on base. Yeah, and you bring up the pitching for the Astros. Justin Verlander really stepped up in game five, I believe it was. Yes. Yeah. He wasn't really good in the World Series in his career. He had a pretty high ERA. And game one, he gave up five runs, but he really showed what he can do, and he really limited the Phillies in Game 5. And then Game 4, the no-hitter, the combined no-hitter, I should say, with Christian Javier and a few others. And I think that was just the key for the Astros, like you said, the starting pitching. And then on the flip side, the Phillies' offense just after Game 3 went ice cold. And even in Game 1 and 2, you saw in Game 1 they got down 5 nothing. They kind of scored all their runs in one or two innings, so – we would like to see them score runs, I don't know, more spread out, but that might be a little much to ask for. But game two, they only put up two. And then the other games that they lost, they didn't score any in game four. They put up two in game five and one in game six. I just don't think that's going to cut it. And I think when you have guys like Reese Hoskins and JT Romuto and Nick Castellanos, who are batting pretty high up in the order, and they're all striking out at a pretty high clip. Listen, I know Romuto. It's not even a- about the strikeouts. It's just that they're not doing anything. Right, and I guess Romuto... Hoskins he, was an out every single time he stepped up to a plate. Right, and I felt like... He never was a threat in the World Series, I felt like. Yeah, I was just going to bring up Romuto's one clutch. It was obviously the go-ahead home run in Game 1, which gave the Phillies the win there. But 
you feel like Cassianos is up. We talked about this on the other show last week. He was up in a lot of big moments. I yeah. felt like in game five and he wasn't able to come through. And Romuto had another potential key hit in game five, but Chaz McCormick obviously made the crazy catch in center field. But if you have guys that are hitting that high in the order and are being paid a lot of money to do that and they should be able to produce, they just weren't producing. And listen, Harper, he was whatever in the series. He wasn't bad, but he wasn't great. Just coming off the NLCS, you would probably expect a little more. And the pitching was okay. I thought the bullpen actually wasn't that bad. I thought there were a few instances where you could have expected more. And I think the huge thing for the Phillies, Nola and Wheeler did not look good. Listen, Wheeler looked good in game six, but Wheeler's game two start was bad. Nola was rocky in his two starts. And the recipe to success for the Phillies throughout the playoffs were they were going to ride Nola and Wheeler in their their starts. And they kind of did. And they got lucky because their other pitchers like Ranger Suarez and Noah Syndergaard, they kind of did their job. But when Nolan Wheeler did not do their job, that's when the offense and the rest of the team suffered. But credit to Houston. I mean, they're just so good top to bottom. And how about Jeremy Pena? I mean, the guy won ALCS MVP, and now he has a World Series MVP, all in his rookie year and a championship. Yeah. I mean, it's great he's got it all. Yeah. And good for Dusty Baker, too. I mean, he's been around for a while. I think he's 73 years old. And for him to finally get a ring, I think he deserves it. Finally, he, as a manager, yeah. As a manager, yes. Yeah. So he's coach a lot of great teams, and he's had a lot of failures. So nice Yeah. Do you think that the Astros, after winning this one, like, obviously, the cheating thing is never going to go away. But do you think, I don't know. Dynasty? Is that what you're going to ask? No, I was going to say, I don't know. Do you think people view them a little differently? Because now that they've won it past the cheating scandal. You think people still despise them? I know people. I don't think the feelings have changed against them at all. I think like that's just going to be what Altuve is known for, especially and him and Bregman, especially because they stayed there. Correa, um, Springer, they left, but I feel like everybody else is going to kind of be who's still who's still there. Alvarez, they're going to Gary Al. They're all going to be known yeah. for this like Tucker. Negative, yeah, all this negative connotation, unfortunately. And they weren't even there all there during college. No, they were not there. Uh, Guriel, don't he's borderline. I, don't, I think he was. I think he was, but Alvarez, no. Um, Definitely not McCormick yeah, or yeah, Maldonado. It's really, only the the older players. Yeah, I don't know if people will view them differently. I don't think they will. But no, I don't think they will. I think it's always going to be like Astros cheaters, just like people view the Patriots that way because of the whole spy gate and then the play gate. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't think the feelings are going to change. Plus, they won, and nobody. Everybody likes a villain. They're the villain of the MLB. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't know if past cheating scandal, they're going to be viewed differently just because, I don't know, new manager, new GM. I don't so know. where do the Phillies go from, from here for next year? I mean, uh, let's realistically, I think this offseason is going to be absolutely insane for the MLB because there's a lot of big players on the market. Trey Turner, Aaron Judge, Bose Redon's opting out, Jacob DeGrom's opting out. Um, that's just a few of the names that I've mentioned. Um, there's obviously others. Carlos Correa has opted out. So there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be guys on the market. Um, I think the question is now at the Phillies, I mean, what is their focus? I, I think it's got to be what, maybe a starter, maybe a bullpen piece and a shortstop, right? Those are the, I mean, maybe a center fielder. Those are kind of like the three, four focuses. Yeah, I would think so. I would actually say second base over shortstop just because. Bryson Stott is a shortstop, so I, I would figure he's uh, so going to be the starter. Uh, so Bryson Stott, you'd rather have him over Trey Turner? Well, no, I was going to suggest they're going to sign probably an infielder. I just don't know what you they're going to do with Hoskins. You don't think they would go over the cap for a big star like Trey Turner? No, I think they would. It's just But you think they would move him to second base? Well, I was proposing that. I don't know what they're going to do with Hoskins because Hoskins is the type of guy that they could keep around. It's just because I don't really know who's going to. He's going to want Reese Hoskins just because he doesn't really have a high batting average, strikes out a lot. I don't know, because Alec Bohm's at third, so you would think they're going to keep him because he's probably going to be under team control for a while. Stott's a young player that they're probably not going to move. Segura's probably going to leave. I think he's a free agent. He has a team option, so I don't know if they're going to keep him around because I think he's owed $17 million. That's a lot of money. But then you have other guys who are definitely going to be staying just because they're signed for a while. Harper, Schwarber, Real Muto. Castellanos, those guys are going to stay. And they picked up Nola's options. So he'll be around. Wheeler's signed for another three years. Yeah, I would think they're going to go after Trey Turner. I just don't know which position he'll play. I think that's the uh, question I think mark. He'll play set, uh, shortstop. I think Bryson Stott would more than likely be moved. Uh, would that not? 
Oh yeah, he could. I think Stott will stay. I just don't know if he'll play short or second. Oh. I would think Bohm is penciled in at third. Yeah, I mean, especially with the way he hit. Yeah, I think you can keep him around. Yeah, I don't know if a lot of Phillies fans are going to overreact to how poor Hoskins was in the postseason. Besides the home runs, the home runs were very timely. They were very good. It's just he didn't really do much. Besides no, no, that. no. I completely agree with you. It's a tough spot. It's a for me the way I look at this guy is like he has had flashes in the past where I know that he can absolutely rake at the plate. Like he is a tremendous power hitter. We know that. And he's a very streaky power hitter too. So I understand the appeal, but also at the same time, he just has to be better. I don't think they're going to move on from him because he was just the NLCS MVP. But if he had another bad season, um, I don't know. Yeah. If it was if it was like a continuation of what we saw in the playoffs, I think it would I do not think discussion. I do not think the Phillies are going to move him just because I don't but know who's going to take him. Right now, if he can. So the thing what I was going to bring up is I just don't think he can hit number two in the lineup. I don't think you can have that kind of production as your number two hitter. Listen, if he was bumped down to maybe five or six, I think that could be something. Yeah. Because if you get people on, I mean, Harper and other guys like Real Muto, if they get on base, that's chances for Hoskins to drive in runs. Because I feel like he doesn't have a lot of chances to drive in runs where he's batting because – he bats behind Schwarber, and Schwarber most of the time is going to either hit home runs or he's going to walk or strike out. So I just don't know if Hoskins hitting second is going to be a smart option going into the season. I think Rob Thompson is probably going to have to move him down the line. I don't know. I just don't think him at number two is a great option. And then that's why you get a guy like Trey Turner, or hopefully you can, and they would move up in the lineup. Right. And then I agree with you what you said earlier about adding a starter. I think – they clearly have a one-two punch with Wheeler and Nola. And I think Suarez can be a solid three. But I agree. They need help because they had some other guys like Syndergaard and Eflin who they're often injured. I mean, when they pitch, they don't really go past five innings. So I think signing a starter would definitely help. And then another bullpen piece could be nice. Yeah. Rodon, you think for sure, is the guy you're looking at? Is that your number one? I haven't really yeah. looked at the other Asian pitchers. Then, um, but Oh, my God, from San Diego. His name is a free agent. I'm forgetting his name. It's worth money to not doubt. Is it Blake Snell, Joe Musgrove? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's Musgrove, but Musgrove is pretty I, good. I don't want to say the wrong name, so that's why. But but Rodon would be a decent option. Rodon would be a, I think would be a good option for any team. The only thing that concerns me about Rodon is that he played in a very pitcher friendly park, right? In in um. What is this? I forget. What, I was about to call it AT&T Park. Oh, I what Oracle name. Park. Oracle Park. Okay. Where the Giants play is obviously a very pitcher-friendly park. It's got huge dimensions, and I mean massive, especially when you go out to center field. I mean, it is very hard to hit it out in, in center field in any direction there, but especially in center field. And if he goes to a smaller park like Philly, I don't know if that's going to help, right? Yeah. Now you see, and it's not just Philly, because there's other ballparks that – you know, are a little friendly too that you guys play regularly. I mean, now the Mets are moving their fence in in right field. Oh, that I did is, not know that. Yeah, they are moving their right field fence in, so that's interesting to see how that will work. Um, I, I, you know, yeah, Atlanta, Miami's definitely pitcher friendly. Yeah, so is Atlanta. I would think Atlanta, kind, like kind I of. I think Atlanta's in the middle. I think Atlanta's a balanced. I think it's one of the more balanced stadiums. Actually, I think you can hit it out. You can. Right field's not that far. It's just yeah. it's kind of a high wall. Left field's deep, but it's doable. Yeah. Miami's definitely pitcher friendly. And the Nationals Park, I think, is average, probably on the shorter side. But yeah. Yeah, Rodon would not be a bad addition, but I think adding another bullpen piece would be nice. It seems like Sir Anthony Dominguez and Jose Alvarado have kind of solidify themselves as good bullpen pieces because they had both had strong seasons. And there's some other guys they bullpen, probably all the problem with bullpen is the most inconsistent position in baseball. Because you never know, you never know you're going to get. One year, it could be really good. One year, it could be bad. But I, I think agree. those guys have proven that they should stick around. But what about the Yankees? What do you think you guys should do? Because, you know, there's a lot. There's of, a lot of things. Lot. I know it starts at the top with Judge. Because you don't know what he's going to do. Literally, I think the first down of the ball. That is, if Aaron Judge is not on the team, then I think you have to do a full type of rebuild. You think they would tear it down all the way? Not necessarily tear it down, but it has to be a focus on young players coming through the system, and they need to play. Like, I don't need to see Isaiah kiner Falefa and Josh Donaldson anymore. They need to be gone. The young players who are here, Barraza, Cabrera, eventually Bowlby, those are the guys that need to play. Um, 
I still like the bullpen. I still think that there's pieces there um, that can actually work. We're going to be getting some guys back from injury in uh, the middle of next season. Um, and maybe, you know, after that, too, it depends on also some of the signings we make. And, like, Chapman's gone. Like, the, that's not even a question. The guy's a joke. He's gone. But as for the starting pitching, too, it's like, where are we going to get there? Like, okay, I think Tyone's okay as, like, a 4-5, or five, but preferably a 5. Um, Nasty Nestor is probably staying, obviously. He had a great season, and I thought he was somebody that we could rely on regularly throughout the regular season. Um, Frankie Montas was an absolute dumpster fire. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm okay with never seeing him again. Garrett Cole is going to be on the team, and he's a huge contract. But what do you do when your highest paid player, it, that's not including Judge, by the way, is Josh Donaldson in the field? He's also one of the worst players on our team. That's a problem. Yeah, I don't know where you yeah, go it's from like, there. You go, and then also Rizzo. Like, what are we going to do for that? Because first base in market is not that strong this year. So he's going to command probably better t- uh, better deals than you would think. Would you be okay with him coming back? I would love to have him back. Yeah. I, I just don't know if that's financially feasible. Because yeah. we have not shown a willingness to go over the cap. Or the luxury tax. So I just, yeah, yeah I think I don't, I don't, all this I don't, revolves around Judge. I think it, you and I completely agree with you. If Aaron Judge is here, we're a winning team. We're probably going to look to make some strong moves. Ideally, it would be nice to, you know, get a shortstop, right? And then also another name I forgot to mention was Xander Bogarts. Oh, that's He's an interesting available. name. Yeah, he opted out, I believe. Yeah, so uh, a lot to still be determined. I think Judge is the biggest chip because he's he's the star of the show, right? Like yeah. He's more than likely going to be the AL MVP. He was the storyline of this entire season. Um, but I, I, if you want me to talk about something else, too, I think it's interesting what's going to happen with Otani because the Angels are going through a ownership change. There's a lot of money that would be tied to him if they re-signed, but who's to say that a new owner is going to want you know, a long-term contract like that because the only other one they have is Mike Trout, but he's Mike Trout. But also at the same time, this is Shohei Otani. So I would expect other teams like the Mets and the Yankees, you know, maybe the Phillies to be aggressive, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't see a reason not to be, especially if you, with some doubt there. So I think that's another big chip that would have to fall. And I think we also need to see what's going to happen with some other teams' free agents, um, uh, like Jacob DeGrom. I mean, what are the Mets going to be? I mean, they were expected to be a powerhouse coming into this year, look good for most of the season. Um, I would expect them to be really, really, really active in free agency. I would but figure they'd want to run it back and then maybe yeah, add some pieces. Uh, I think they're going to add. Add some pieces, yeah. I re- I really think that they're a sleeping giant in the judge conversation. They worry me. the The thought of the Mets outbidding the Yankees, I think, is very real. Wow, that's scary for both of us. Yeah, considering he played for you, and then if he joined the Mets, it'd be my raw rival team. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I know that would be a disaster. Especially because they have an owner who has a lot of money, and, and he's a fan who wants to not spend willing, money. He's not willing to save it; he's willing to spend it. Yeah, he wants to win, and that is the primary focus. But yeah, I think there's a lot of dominoes to fall this off season, and then they'll be off season a long one too. Because the, we uh, yeah. there's gonna be nothing going on until March. Well, an interesting thing that my roommate brought up was that the World Baseball Classic is in 2023 starting i think in march yeah and I, so i think he was suggesting that a lot of these deals because recently the mlb offseason hasn't really kicked into gear meaning that the big names haven't really signed until february march but i think said, this oh, year might be different winter meetings. it used to be all oh, the winter meetings in december winter meetings in december right and, and the now, lockout didn't help that cause either well that but yeah, all that's kind of off that the was, table now. That because... was last year but now the winter meetings are nothing because nobody's signing these deals they're not they're not aggressive so the point that he was suggesting, my roommate, was that maybe these deals are going to happen sooner. Maybe they happen before the new year, or maybe they happen in January. Because I don't know, maybe these players want to know where they're going to be. I mean, that's all good before and well. Before the we really think that uh, most like, players care about the World Baseball Classic. Probably not. Probably not. No, they probably some do. Care. Maybe, but I'm going to be honest. They'll show a little pride. I think if you ask most baseball fans, they don't care about the World Baseball Classic. I don't. I, I honestly do not care. Maybe it's the thing they see in TV. They're like, oh, I'll watch it. It but, has yeah. no history. It has no bearing. It has, it's not like, it, I guess the point is it's supposed to be exciting, like the World Cup. 
there is no resemblance at all. Which to, is happening in two weeks, by the yeah, way. Yeah, to w- the World Cup at all. The excitement for it is not even close. And that's what they're trying to be, but it's a failure. First of all, half the time the games are on at these ridiculously stupid times when we play, uh, like, they love playing the games at, uh, especially when they do the different pools and they play in a different stadium. Oh, yeah, let's go watch Japan play whoever. And the games, oh, let's look at that. Oh, it's 7 a.m. in the morning. Like, half these games are on at the stupidest times. I mean... I, I'm not going to wake up that, just to watch a game on MLB Network that I don't even know half the guys playing. Right. I just don't care. At, at least in soccer, I know that it's the stars. I don't know if it's the stars in, in this, especially for the other countries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, it's an exciting event. At least it's a, that's what they're trying to portray it as. But yeah, I think it's just another MLB failure, if you want my honest opinion. It's a stupid time for it. Baseball season is not popular in March, right? If you want it to be popular, you would have to cut into your actual season, right? Because the most, I think the most popular time for baseball when it peaks is probably this, in the summer in terms of the fan base. Whenever basketball and hockey ends, that's their time to shine right there. Yeah, that exactly. little two-month window when football is not really around. Not in March yeah. when we got college basketball going on and we got, you know. NBA, NHL. Yeah, I was going to say, not like every things. other sport is going on. Yeah, basketball. also, I don't know how the World Baseball Classic would conflict with Spring training. I'm not sure. Well, they how just it let them train for the um, for the World Baseball Classic with their teams. But you know what happens half the time? These guys get hurt. The last one, Didi Gregorius, got hurt. The Yankees were missing them. You think they were happy about that? No. We see pitching injuries all the time. Yeah. Also, they haven't had this event in six years because COVID was during the last one that was supposed to be played, which was 2020. So they didn't have that. I don't know. It was just something that my roommate brought up. I didn't really think about it. So. Yeah. I mean, no, I'm thinking maybe, but I really don't think that the most players care about it. Maybe, it, maybe a couple stars here and there. I mean, there's been some good moments in the World Baseball Classic, but I don't know, nothing that you would remember off the top of your head. No. I think to Who won the world most, World Baseball Classic. I don't even fans. know. I couldn't even tell you. I couldn't. Tell I'm you. gonna guess it was like Puerto Rico or Venezuela or America. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I wore Japan. I don't know. I couldn't even tell you who played. That's honestly how much of a nod bearing thing it has become. It, it, who cares? That's what I would say. All right, want to move on to some NFL? Sure. Let's uh, talk about the slate yesterday. I think we have a lot of places we could start. Um, Let's go through the, all the games. Just and go at the we'll, top. We'll wrap it up with Ravens tonight because obviously we want to dedicate some time to that. And there's also some uh, college football scores from Saturday that oh, yeah, we might talk. be worth talking about. We can about. talk about that too. There's not that many games, so I think we can get through it fast. Let's start in Atlanta, shall we? Let's do it. All right. Chargers 2017 over the Falcons. Um, Cameron Dicker, the former Eagle, actually, he had a kick with you guys. And now he kicked Dicker the Chargers. The kicker, yeah. Yeah. To victory over the Falcons. Um, I don't really know what to say about this game other than it was a slow, slowly started game by the Chargers, and they're fortunate to win. I'll, I'll say that. Um, I thought the Falcons were the better of the two teams the entire day. Um, I thought they ran the ball better. I thought that they controlled the game kind of better. And it's just unfortunate for the Falcons because they really didn't give up that many points to a pretty good offense. And they still unfortunately lost the, lost the game. Sorry. The killer play for them was when they recovered the fumble and then they gave it back in the fourth quarter. Yeah, but wasn't he down? I don't know. Yeah, he was down. I think so. Yeah, he was. Uh, Austin Eckler was down. So that's why they got the ball near midfield. But yes, that was a funny play because the ghost ripped it out of his hand. <laughs> it was just, I don't even know what happened, but he just fell. He was thinking about the end zone before he ever got there. Yeah, this is a weird back and forth game. Definitely a slow starting game. And Herbert had a pick too. He was really just not good. No, I don't know. That's He threw the ball a lot and he was just not. It's one of those games where if you're the Chargers, you're taking the win, you're just running away with it. And then for the Falcons, it's a tough one, especially because – you were in first place in the uh, NFC South. Now you're tied for first, I guess, technically in second with Tampa Bay winning yesterday. But, yeah, it's a type of game where I think for the Falcons, it's the type of game that you would love to win to keep your momentum going. But, yeah, it was kind of just a weird game. Late game drama. but A lot of turnovers on both parts, too. I mean, the Falcons had two fumbles. Um, yeah. Um, the uh, Chargers had a fumble. I mean, it was just... And, and an interception. This is not a clean game. It just was not a good game. Not many all. fireworks. No. But no. speaking of fireworks, the Dolphins and the Bears yeah. had some fireworks. Yeah, let's talk about this game for a second because I was actually kind of impressed with the Bears. I know that's not really the storyline here. Everybody's talking about, okay, the Dolphins' offense is insane. 
But I thought Justin Fields, like, he's getting better. He's getting a lot better. I mean, I used to think this guy was horrible, and then he would have no chance in the league. But you know what? He plays with absolutely, like, literally zero talent around him. Like, that's just the truth. He does not play with much around him. They finally got Claypool this week, but he didn't really have much of an effect. But you know what? This kid still finds a way to make plays, whether it's on the ground or, you know, through the air. He did have three touchdown passes through the air, albeit it was only 123 yards passing. But still, he was effective. He saw When he saw green grass, he ran for it. He made things happen out there. And that's what you need out of a quarterback. Yeah, we know what he can do with his legs. I mean, you saw him run all over the field yesterday. But I just am impressed with the Bears offense in general. They don't really have much, like you said, outside of fields. But the last three weeks, they put up 33, 29, and 32 points. I mean, I think a lot of people would see the Bears putting up these kind of numbers offensively. Absolutely not. They've shown that they can do it, and it just sucks for them because they did all that yesterday. They put up 32 points, and they still lost to the Dolphins because the Dolphins, as we now have this really high-octane offense, and I think the new additions, I mean, we can talk about Bradley Chubb on defense, but Jeff Wilson was a nice spark plug in there. He He ran for 51 yards on nine carries, which is – Pretty good for someone who's not really supposed to be the starter. It's supposed to be Mostert, and Mostert had an off day yesterday. So Wilson definitely picked up the slack there. But And then Tyreek Hill as well. Yeah, Tyreek Hill just continues to do his thing. I mean, 143, one touchdown. Seems like an average day for him because he's that's just what he does. But I am impressed with the Bears. I do think Fields is progressively getting better. I think there's still some ways to go passing-wise, but you can definitely see that he can make some plays. Concerned about the Dolphins' defense, though. They're going to have to step up later in the season. This can't be keep going on. You can't keep giving up 30 points there all the time. Yeah. I do think they're down the road. I still think they're going to be a team that's going to be around because they still haven't lost with Tua as the starter. I agree. I think that they – well, I guess technically the Bridgewater game when Tua got – Yeah, that's true. Besides that, I mean – they have played okay with the way I scored that spray. And then let's go to Cincinnati, where there was an absolute destruction yesterday on the field. Um, the Panthers and Bengals faced off. The Panthers were able to put up 21 in the second half, but make no mistake, they were absolutely embarrassed at halftime because it was 35 0. Uh, Baker Mayfield came in the game for PJ Walker. And to my surprise, Baker Mayfield actually didn't play that bad. No, he looked okay. And Carolina is just a very dysfunctional team for many reasons. They have made a coaching change, the Robbie Anderson thing. I mean, there's so much going on there. And I actually saw something that Sam Darnold was made active, and they play Thursday night this week. So I don't know if they're going to do a quarterback. Well, yeah, I don't know either. Quarterback's been there. Sam Darnold's going to get a chance eventually, right? I mean, because we're at week nine, we still have eight more weeks left. Yeah. And actually, oh, no, I'm sorry, we have nine more weeks left. Listen, so I know Carolina is going to get probably at least three starts. Here. Listen, I don't think Carolina is going to make any noise. They're only two games back in first place. Yeah, I know. That's the funny With part. the tiebreaker over Tampa Bay. They actually have that tiebreaker, which is crazy to say, but they're not really going anywhere. They are just a terrible football team. I'll just say it right here, right now. They're just a bad football team. Yeah. But the story of the day for the Bengals and just the game in general was Joe Mixon. The guy just had a day. I think he had five touchdowns. The guy just had a day. I mean, he was running all over. He was just finding ways to get down in the red zone and just punch it in. And that's great news for the Bengals because I think that's the one player that they need to use more often. I agree. I sat here and said that on Friday. Yeah, you've been echoing it for a long time. And and I think four touchdowns this week. And I think that really makes Joe Burrow's life a lot easier, especially when you just hand it off and he can do the rest. And I also think it can open up the play action. And I know they don't chase. So given the ball like T. Higgins, it could be good. But it wasn't just Joe Mixon either. Like Samaj P. Ryan was very effective as well. He had six carries for 51 yards. Right. And we talk about this sometimes on the show, spreading the ball around. We talk about a lot of the Chiefs, but the Bengals did it yesterday. Higgins had seven catches. You talk about Tyler Boyd and Hayden Hurst. They each had five. Mixon had four. I mean, that's with no Jamar, though. Good job has spreading happen. around. That, that has to happen. Listen, Jamar is probably going to take away some of those targets. Maybe they don't run the ball as much, but that's a good recipe. I don't know. I would, I would stick to the running game because it's working pretty good right now. Yeah. I just feel like sometimes, I don't know if it's coaching or Joe Burrow, but sometimes they get pass happy. I think they need to watch that when Jamar Chase comes I think back. It's coaching. Yeah. But they're in a good spot. They're five and four. They're still right in the thick of it with the AFC North race going on there and the, Big game tonight in the AFC North. We'll talk about that later. Not with two teams in the AFC North, but just one. But let's go to the NFC North. 
Packers and the Lions <laughs> squared off in Detroit. The and fans get it done, baby. Yeah, the Lions pull off an upset. They win 15-9. And I don't know if this is about the Lions. It's obviously a great win for the Lions because they're the type of team where you feel like they're always in a lot of these games and they can just never pull it out. And they did yesterday. But this is just about the Packers, in no, my the opinion. Packers are the Packers are the Packers are hot. As you say, the Packers are a dumpster fire. The Packers are a dumpster fire. Is that the worst game you've ever seen Aaron Rodgers play in a Green Bay uniform? I think that is. I think so. I don't even think that was up for discussion. I mean, this guy was terrible. Three picks? Oh my God, is he even looking where he threw the ball half the time? I mean, it's an actual question I have because it was so bad. I don't even know. He was the leading rusher yes, uh, yesterday. It's terrible. Too. I mean, this is against the, one of the worst defenses in the NFL. Actually, it's the worst. The, the worst. Defense. They kept saying it so many times in the telecast just to remind the Packers fans that, yeah, your offense just put up nine points against the worst defense. In the NFL. Yep, and then between Dylan and Jones, they combined. They couldn't even combine for 60 yards. Yeah, that's not going to cut it. No, not going to cut it at all. I don't know where the Packers go moving forward. Listen, I know they – don't have a lot on the outside, and you would think that their two running backs would help a little bit. It seems to train. What can you do? I mean, here's the thing. They need to make a decision. Are we building around Aaron with what we have? And if so, what do we need to do to do that? I think the answer is pretty clear. It needs to be get some receivers and get some receivers now. Because if they added Odell Beckham tomorrow, I think there would be a, a complete change in the locker room, right? Oh, no doubt. If they added him. He would definitely room. provide some energy in the he locker room. He would absolutely provide some energy. And then for them, the only way they're going to get back in the playoff mix is through the wild card because Minnesota is running away at seven and one. Yeah. So I mean, or do they decide, okay, this is not working. We have too much money tied to one player, and he's not underperforming with his age. He needs to go. I don't know what I think. Doing. That's a, I think that's a fair decision. And also I, something I you brought up. Surpri- I would not be surprised if that discussion ensues again this offseason. Yeah, and something you brought up when we were talking about them playing Buffalo the week before was you were a little skeptical about Matt LaFleur and his play yeah, calling. And it was not good yesterday. I just think it continued yesterday. Yeah, it was terrible again yesterday. There's just nothing great. explosive. What I is think that Tiari pass? What is that? Just get in the end zone. I know. You need to be throwing the lineman. You can barely get in the end zone as is. I know. That was doing? too fancy. Why? Why? He's an idiot. All right, moving on to New England, or is there anything else you want to add about that? I mean, I think it was pretty much we hit the point that the Packers are a dumpster fire. Yeah, good win for the Lions. Yeah, good win for the Lions. Congrats to the Lions. They did what they need to do, and their defense stepped up. Yep. Uh, the Patriots absolutely blow out the Colts, and it results in Frank Reich being fired to this morning after the game. There's not really anything to say here except the Patriots' defense just absolutely dominated. And then uh, per usual, which is like an every week thing, we had um, – you know, Ramadre Stevenson have a decent game, but also the Pats just do what they have to do to win, and the Colts are also a dumpster fire to win. Yeah. Or dumpster fire and a loss um, is what I meant to say. I mean, these guys, the Colts, they can't do anything. They can't pass. They can't block. I mean, they can't stop the run. I, I don't know what – I just don't know what this team does. Do, do they practice? I don't know. Uh, do they plan for the games? Because it sure doesn't look like it. Um, they just look lifeless out there. Yeah, they. that's exactly the way to describe it. They are a dead team walking. <laughs> and at 3-5-1, and one, uh, this team, I don't It's it amazes me that they got three wins, and one of which came against my own team. Embarrassment. And Matt Ryan is never going back out there because they owe him $17 million if he passed. Uh, if he doesn't pass a physical next year. So if he gets hurt in any way, they have to pay him $17 million. Ouch. Yeah, so they are just not playing him because they don't want to pay that guy a dime because they really don't see him as a long-term answer. Um, and Ellinger's horrible. So I guess that only leaves one quarterback if if Sam Ellinger is not the guy. And that could be Nick Foles. Do you, <laughs> do you think Nick Foles gets a chance at any point this year? I could see it. Maybe. And it'd be interesting if they made that decision soon because they play the Eagles actually in week 11. <laughs> so funny. I hope they let him start again. That would be something. It doesn't matter. They're going to lose anyway. Nothing to worry about. But And then Jonathan Taylor obviously has been hurt. And that's kind of really It's just good. been a rough year. Yeah. I mean, I don't know really where they go from here. I think they obviously have to find a QB. That's the most important position. They got to figure out something there for either just the short term or if they're going to build long term. But if you flip it to the New England side, I mean, this is just a 
Nice easy win for them. Another win for the dub. And another, you know what? Win for the Pats. And you know what? You bring up another win. They're five and four, and they're right in the thick of it in the East. They are only a game back at Buffalo, and they still have two head to head matchups with Buffalo, and they have a huge win over the Jets, which they That's got nice two weeks ago. And yeah, they go on by this week, but they play the Jets the following week. That's a big game for both teams. And you know what's interesting in that game? They the lost Jets to Miami. Are, the Jets are also on by. Right. So you have two teams coming off a bye, which is a rarity, I feel like, in the NFL. Definitely rarity. Playing each other. And yeah, that division's crazy. We're actually going to talk about the Bills and Jets. Do you want to do it now? I feel like we should just go into it. Yeah, let's go right into it. Yeah. So yeah, the Buffalo Bills, they went to MetLife Stadium yesterday to take on the Jets. And a lot of people were probably thinking, oh, Buffalo probably going to win the game. But I think a lot of people have some respect for the Jets now because the Jets are were five and three going in. I know they haven't really been good at all the last few years. They've kind of been just been the team that you could laugh at when you have them on their schedule. You're like, oh, my God, here's the free win. But no, they are not a free win anymore. They come out of nowhere and they defeat the Bills 20 to 17. And the thing that was most impressive for me is the defense has been pretty solid all year. And I thought they did a really good job containing Josh Allen yesterday because Josh Allen did not have a great day. And I especially thought the defense was very good in that last drive where Buffalo got the ball back down three and you saw Buffalo fumble the ball. They lost a lot of yards and they had third and 21, fourth and 26 or whatever, fourth and 21. And they weren't able to get it done. And I actually thought that throw by Allen that he made to Gabe Davis, that was right on the money. Well, you want to hear what's even crazier? Josh Allen has a UCL injury. He injured his UCL uh, in his arm. He is making attempts to play through it, but he has an elbow injury. So if that's kind of the doubt of what was wrong with Josh Allen yesterday, it's that. He's playing hurt. He didn't play great. Give the credit to the Jets. I thought that their offensive game plan was decent because they just ran the ball and they made sure that Zach Wilson could not mess up the game for them. And Buffalo couldn't stop the run. And Buffalo couldn't stop it. And They couldn't what? get off you the field. Get, sometimes it's just about putting your hand in the dirt and blocking forward, and that's exactly what the Jets did. They played old-fashioned football. And listen – there's a lot of teams that can't stop the run. The Chiefs couldn't stop the run last night, but now the Bills can't stop the run. The Bengals aren't too great at stopping the run. I mean, listen, if you're an AFC team and you can control, I like I think to yesterday opened up the entire AFC. I don't see a reason that anybody in the AFC who is not, except for like maybe a handful of teams, and I'm talking a select few. I like maybe there's a lot of teams that could there's a lot of teams that come out of the AFC that could just kick it into gear at any point and just run through this thing. I mean, listen, obviously the Chiefs, great team. They won last night, but not a pretty game. No. And now the Bills lose yesterday. There's some Josh Allen injury concerns. Um, a team like the Dolphins, tremendous offense, but obviously we know they have flukes on defense. Yeah. Team like the Jets, they have a great defense, but we're not 100 percent confident in their quarter. And you got the Bengals, who were obviously been there, done that last year. But you got the Ravens. They're trying to kick it into gear. The even Ravens, the Browns, man. I mean, listen. Yeah. Even got- you see the Chargers. I know they're not great. I mean, they haven't really impressed too much, but they can kick it into gear offensively. I mean, listen. Look at a team like the Browns. They're three and five now, right? If they can get to a point where they're around 500 when they get to Sean Watson back. Maybe they can get hot. That's what I was saying all along. I think if I they can get back to 500, I, they yeah, can make a run. I think that that's going to be a huge addition. And I really think a lot of people are kind of undervaluing that. I think people are forgetting about it. I think people are forgetting about them too. I kind of agree with you. Welcome back to After the Whistle here on WLOI Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOI.org and Campus TV channel. Hodge Love Point One. We're going to pick up right where we left off here with the week nine slate of the NFL. We have some games to discuss. We'll get into some college football as well, but we're going to pick it up at the Minnesota Vikings at the Washington commanders. Kind of an interesting game coming in Minnesota at six and one Washington at four and four Washington ripping off some wins here with Taylor Heineke and the Minnesota kind of just cruising along with their schedule, but Minnesota escapes with the 2017 win. Jimmy, what were your thoughts overall on how Minnesota was able to get out of Washington with a win? Uh, they snuck by. Um, they beat a bad team. Uh, they took advantage against a team that's really still not that great. I'll uh, stand on that hill. Uh, Heineke had an interception. Cousins had an interception. I didn't think the uh, Vikings were very effective running the ball. And it also felt like they really didn't work that hard to get the ball to Justin Jefferson in the beginning of the game. But thankfully, he was effective as the game went on. He was able to get a touchdown. Um I thought they did a decent enough job incorporating Hawkinson in, though. That was that was a good part to see. 
Um, so uh, there's some uh, some reason to be excited from that game. But other than that, I, I didn't think it was like a great win for the, for the Vikings. I mean, it's nice to come back, but I don't think that was a position they should have been in against that team. That's the truth. Yeah, and I guess the question moving forward is, do you believe in the Vikings? Because no, they're 7-1. I don't. I don't believe in their defense. I think it's really suspect. I guess there's my answer. <laughs> I, I just don't. Like, if you're if you're telling me that they're playing against the Eagles, I would take the Eagles uh, 10 out of 10 times. If you're telling me they play against the Vikings, I think the Vikings 10 out of 10 times. Um, if they're playing against the Cowboys, I'd probably take the Cowboys. Um, I just don't really trust them. Yeah, I think they're a team that they play they're some, probably going to win a lot of games. They, they play some really tough games in the next month. So I think that could be the litmus test for them. Yep, that's exactly it. So we're going to shift it to the AFC with the uh, Vegas Raiders and Jacksonville Jaguars game. And the Jaguars are down a lot in this game. They find a way to come back and they win 27-20 at home. I think the story here is just the Raiders are so disappointing. I mean, everywhere you look at it, they just seem to find a way to just lose games. And they were up big in this game. I think it was 17 nothing. Yep, 17 nothing. it was. I think that's what it was. And Jacksonville kind of rallied the troops and found a way to come back. Any thoughts here? Um. Yeah, here's my thoughts. The Raiders are a dumpster fire. I mean, there's just nothing else that you can say. For them to blow this game, it's just unacceptable. Um, losing to the Jaguars, this just can't happen for them. And, and this was a game they needed, I felt like, to kind of kick their game into or their gear. In, into place for the season. They needed to really get going, and they did not do that. And they got the ball to Devontae Adams. They did what they wanted to do in the first half. Um, this guy was a beast, especially in the first quarter. But it was just like after that, I mean, the just Jaguars just took over. I mean, in the in the second half, they dominated. They had a touchdown. They had two touchdowns, and that was the game. Um, just they were in control on offense, and the Raiders just could not do anything on offense in the second half. They didn't finish the game. It's just that simple. At two and six, I think they're kind of done. Yeah, I believe it's done. Unless they go on some winning streak, but I think they're done there. And then speaking of another Western team, actually two Western teams that squared off yesterday in the NFC West, the Seattle Seahawks, they go down to Arizona and they beat the Cardinals 31-21. Straight for those Another big win for Seattle. I think they're a team that a lot of people thought they were going to do much this year, but now they're sitting at six and three. They're alone at the top of the NFC West. I'm just impressed overall with Geno Smith. I think you start there. He's been a guy who's completing a very high percentage of his passes. I think he's leading the league actually in completion percentage. And then they have guys like Kenneth Walker who can run the ball pretty effectively. And they have two studs in the outside with Metcalf and Lockett. And you know what? Noah Fant to finally do something. And Noah Fant, he showed up a little bit. Yeah, Noah Fant actually did something. But that's surprising. I think the story there, besides the Seahawks just continue to impress people, is the Cardinals are just in disarray. And we've both talked about this. We're both on the train of Cliff Kingsbury, probably not going to be around too much longer. Probably not. To, shouldn't be. How about that? So, so I don't know. That's the train, Mom. We know the leash is short. I just yeah. don't know how short it is. Uh, it should be really short because this team's a dumpster fire. And it all starts on offense. Kyler Murray's uh, turnover on that fumble is where that where the, the decline started for the Cardinals yesterday. Uh, that's my opinion. And they didn't What's really that? get help running the ball besides Murray. Murray, I think, had 60 yards, but... Not much there. How about the Seattle defense, though? They've played a lot better since kind of being a little suspect early in the season. Yeah, they have a few guys on that defense who can make plays. It's just as a unit, they kind of question how they would perform. But and they got Bruce Irvin back. Yeah, it's a big addition for them. I mean, yeah. he's been there before. Uh, yeah, I, I think they're going to be a team that might be around for a little bit. And yeah, I think they, that, they just keep getting wins. And I think San Francisco is probably going to be their challenger just based on the standings right now because LA has looked bad too. And we're going to talk about them actually right now. But huge game, division, for, it's huge game for Seahawks next week, though. Um, they play the Bucks in Germany. Yeah, that is a massive game that we'll talk about next week. So we'll see if they can take their success overseas and continue it. But we talk about the other NFC West team here, the LA Rams. They traveled to Tampa Bay all the way across the country to face off against the Bucks. And this is supposed to be a pretty high profile game with the two quarterbacks. This is a rematch of the divisional round. And it really just wasn't because both these teams are just having very subpar seasons. But Tampa Bay finds a way to come back with a late touchdown and they squeak out a 16-13 win. And this is a game that LA I felt like was in control the whole way. Mm-hmm. They kind of outplayed Tampa Bay for the majority of the game. And then you saw Tampa Bay score 10 points in the fourth and it was enough. You know what the problem was? They settled for field goals when they needed touchdowns. 
Yeah. He set two field goals in the third quarter. The only that play was- where they really wowed some people was that long touchdown to Cooper Cup, mm-hmm. which was back, I think, in the second quarter. Yep, it was early in the second But you're quarter. right. I mean, when you're settling for three, I mean, three is not bad. But when you can get seven multiple times and you can't do it, that's going to hurt. Also, Stafford's a train wreck. I mean, he's just a train wreck at quarterback. 13 for 27? Come on. That's not good enough. It's never going to cut it. Yeah, and the other thing is they haven't really been a good rushing team during their success. success besides, besides, terrible. They haven't been a good running team, I feel like, since the Tug early days. They haven't really found someone that can just take the ball 20 times and do it. You'd think it'd be Cam Akers, but he's had his issues off the field, but well, Cam Akers was also ineffective. He had the ball five right. times yesterday for three yards. Yeah, and Henderson's been there, but I don't know. He doesn't really offer you much. He can be serviceable, but not really more much more than that. And then Brady on the other side, he wasn't like, oh, he wasn't bad, but he threw it 50 something times. I don't know. Both these teams are very similar in that they're supposed to be good, but they're just not good. And I don't know. They both have things to fix, but two teams coming into their game yesterday, and this is the Sunday night game between the Titans and the Chiefs. These two teams were both the five and two, and these two teams had a lot of things going right for them. The Titans coming in the year, not really a team that was talked about a lot. They were coming in at five and two, pretty surprisingly good record. And then Kansas City coming in, obviously we know what they have. They have a great offense. They got Mahomes running the show. And this is a crazy game because for a while, you're thinking Tennessee actually might pull this off. They were up 17-9, I believe. And Malik Willis wasn't doing much through the air. And then Mahomes has a late touchdown late in the game. And then he runs it in for two. And then coin flip goes Kansas City's way. And they actually didn't even score in their initial possession. Well, actually, they did. They kicked the field goal. But Tennessee actually had a chance to win it. That was after Butker had missed uh, a field goal. Um, And he also missed a PAT. Yeah, so that was my fault. They did score in their first possession, the Chiefs. And then Titans actually had the ball and then didn't do anything. But... I don't know. Is this kind of a lucky win for KC, or what did you say? Um, I think they're very susceptible to the run, especially via quarterback, because I thought Malik Willis actually did a pretty decent job running the ball as a quarterback. However, his passing was not great. Um, but he's also decision making in general is just not great. I think that's the problem that he has, and that's what he's going to have to work to improve on. I think it was good for him to get some experience, but I think the focus is Ryan Tannehill is going to be more than likely going back. As for the Chiefs, though, they're the story of this game. I would just say that their offense did not look great last night. There is a way to stop this offense. Um, and I think controlling the clock is also another way to do it. And I thought the I thought the Titans did a pretty good job of that. And the Titans stuck to their game plan, running the ball, defense. They didn't try and compromise themselves just because they're playing the Chiefs and try and go all crazy. They stuck to running the ball. And I, I have to say, I'm credit to them. Because they put themselves in a position to win. I think Willis is definitely going to be the guy they want long term at quarterback. But oh, I don't know. I don't. I really don't know. Like well, I don't know. But I, I think, think that's the hope. But I don't know. If that is the hope. I don't know if that's the current situation. They definitely need him to improve as a passer. I mean, five for 16 is terrible. Yeah. And I guess it's one thing. Oh, why aren't they calling more throwing plays? But they can't. That's why. Yeah, I didn't think it was a bad. I didn't think it was a bad called game at all. I actually thought it was a pretty good called game by the the Titans coaches. I'm surprised they didn't win. I actually thought they had it, but I don't know. It's tough to win in the league sometimes, especially when you got Kansas City on the other side. Basically, a threat to score every time they have the ball. But let's jump into the Monday night game. We have three minutes left. The Baltimore Ravens they will travel down to the Bayou to take on. The New Orleans Saints. This is an interesting matchup. You have Baltimore coming in at five and three. They've had a Somewhat of a solid season. They've won some pretty decent games this year, but they've also been known to blowing leads in the fourth quarter. That's another discussion you could have. And then the Saints on the other side, they're coming at three and five. Kind of a disappointing record considering the talent that they have, both offensively and defensively. And now Michael Thomas gone for the year. There's more pressure on guys like Alvin Kamara and Chris Olave. And they've had some changes to QB. They had Jameis Winston start the year, but now I think it's Andy Dalton. I think it's Andy Dalton starting, right? Tonight? Yep, of course. So Andy Dalton, the red rifle. Yeah, you would think that Dalton is kind of past his prime days, but you know what? They've shown the Saints in the last few weeks that they can put up points. They've actually put up a lot of points in their games, and they haven't won all of them, but they have shown that they can keep up with other teams. And on the flip side, you have Baltimore's Lamar Jackson, who we know what he can do with his legs, and he's been pretty good this year, just having another solid year. Uh, I was going to ask you, Jamie, like, who do you like? Because 
I think this is a game that Baltimore should win, and I'm going to pick Baltimore to win just because I think they're a better team. But the Saints have shown that they can put up points, and considering the Ravens' defense this year hasn't been typical Ravens' defense, they could show them maybe they can put up points again. Yeah, so, Jeffrey, the one thing that I'm focused on for both these teams is injuries because we know Mark Andrews is not playing. We know Gus Edwards is hurt for the Ravens. And then we don't um, – Marcus Peters is a little banged up. Link Harrison is a little banged up. These are guys who play for them on defense. And that stinks because injuries are something you got to deal with. Um, and in my opinion, I think that the Saints injuries are a little less worse. Like, obviously, they don't have Marshawn Lattimore. And that's going to – that's a brutal loss for them. But I like the way the rest of their team is playing, especially on offense. I mean, they, they have kind of been putting up some decent points lately. I mean, the Arizona game, I know Andy Dalton's train wreck with the interceptions, but they still put up points besides that. Last week, too, I thought was their most complete game of the season. They looked pretty good in that one. Um, really, I don't. I just don't know what else to say besides the injuries. Um, I think it's just going to come down to who sticks to their game plan and, and really is able to limit themselves on the mistakes because whoever turns the ball over more is going to put themselves in such a bad position because the truth is, especially with the Ravens, I don't trust their defense. I just don't. Um, as for the Saints defense, it was supposed to be good. It's good up front, but it's a little suspect in defensive backfield. So um, I have concerns about both of these teams' as defenses, and I have concerns about their injuries. So I think this is going to be a close one. I think the key, especially though, for the Ravens, they have to stop Alvin Kamara. They cannot let him have a big game because if he does, that's not great for them. But also on the Saints end, they need to stop the run of the Ravens and force them to pass. So if I had to make a pick, um, oof, tough, tough to make a pick here. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I would say it's a toss-up right now. I mean, I can see either of these teams winning, if you want me to be completely honest with you. I think this is going to be a close, close game. I may actually go New Orleans because they're home. Yeah. You think they could tie? You think the tie is a possibility? I mean, listen, no doubt the, the best player on the field tonight is Lamar Jackson. He has the most ability out of anyone. But I think it depends a lot about how the Saints defensively go up against him. We've seen them shut down like big time quarterbacks before. That's not something that they struggle with, especially a la Tom Brady. Yeah, a la Tom Brady. Um, and they can game plan for these big game for these games well, and they play pretty well at home. So I don't know. I, I might go Saints. Yeah, that's definitely a viable pick, I would think. But we're gonna briefly touch on this real quick. I know we're running over time here, but college football was a wild Saturday. We had two notable games: Tennessee and Georgia, and Alabama and LSU. And Georgia manhandled Tennessee. I think for the most part. I forget what the final score was, but I believe they won somewhere like the 24-6 range. I don't know if that was the final or 27-6, but it looks like the Georgia of last year and the last few years, dominant defense. Offense has a pretty good day, and Tennessee's offense can really get anything going. Nope. And then the shocker was down at LSU. LSU pulls off an upset at home. They beat the Alabama Crimson Tide, and I think it's kind of the end for Alabama this year. I think they're not going to make the playoff. It's two losses. No. Considering LSU is ahead of them in the SEC, you got teams like Ole Miss, who they play this week, Alabama, so that's a big game and you got Tennessee and Georgia I just don't think Bama can get in but what do you think is going to happen tomorrow night in the rankings because I would think Georgia could go to one Georgia's absolutely one Georgia you would think yeah absolutely the only question mark there was Ohio State was ahead of them I think yeah, no. so I don't know who's number one so they're going to be number yeah one. um Georgia's number one I would think Ohio State is probably number two um oh, then it gets tough from there and it gets tough from there because you have tcu undefeated you got now lsu right they were a top 10 team if yeah. they win the sec are they in the playoff lsu do they have one loss they have two losses they have two losses i don't know tennessee and florida state that's a losses though yeah tennessee's not a bad loss is considering how good they are they didn't but... play good that game I, that's what i'm saying florida state there is a bad loss. so much that could happen so I think time. Michigan's going to be in the top four. I yeah. think they deserve a spot. Um, Clemson also lost. That was another yeah. big domino that fell. Clemson was number five, I believe, in the – I had a CFP or AP poll. I'm going to get mixed up, but they lost, so they're going to drop a bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so – So their status is kind of in teams jeopardy. Teams like TCU control their own destiny now. Went out. Same thing with Ohio State and Michigan. Went out. Yeah, that Bama Ole Miss game is probably the biggest game on the schedule this week. Mm -hmm. Still have Ohio State, Michigan coming up on Thanksgiving break, but yeah, there's a lot gonna that's gonna happen. There's a lot of dominoes that are gonna fall, and a lot of teams are gonna shuffle up and down the rankings. So 
we'll definitely be keeping an eye out for that. But I think that's going to be all of our time here. And after the whistle, thank you for listening. We'll be back on Friday talking some more sports. So have a great rest of your weekend. We will see you then.